My name is Kevin Clues. This is my colleague, Yuan Chen. Uh, we're going to be talking today about which GPU sharing strategy is right for you uh, with a comprehensive benchmark study using DRA. Um, so, you know, to kick things off, why do we even care about uh, sharing GPUs? Um, well, at the end of the day, it's really about increasing the utilization of the GPUs that you have uh, access to, as well as decreasing the costs. Because the more efficient use of the GPUs that you have, the fewer GPUs that you need to get your work done, and that then obviously leads to uh, lower costs. Um, this has been a hot topic uh, at lots of the past previous KubeCons over the years. Um, at KubeCon Paris, uh, just last April, uh, there was five talks that were related to GPU sharing. In Chicago, there was a couple. Um, and then every KubeCon all the way back through 2019, there's been some talk that had to do with how can I make more efficient use of my GPUs using some type of GPU sharing strategy. Um, a couple of use cases for, for GPU sharing uh, that are, that are uh, the most obvious ones um, are if you have a single user that wants to run multiple applications on top of some GPU, uh, if he's trying to do you know, multiple inference jobs uh, for, for testing um, uh, what the type of applications that he's trying to run. Um, you can also have a single tenant with multiple users, so a couple of different users that want to share access to a GPU because they're running Jupyter Notebooks, they're trying to um, you know, build uh, models that they want to do for training, but they don't have all of the details worked out. And so they just want to use a subset of a GPU to test things out before they run their, their full training job over potentially you know, multiple GPUs. Um, and there's also use cases for things uh, that are more multi-tenant, where you want to have multiple users running apps on top of a single GPU in some kind of environment where uh, it's appropriate for managed cloud services uh, that need to be multi-tenant. Um, there's two primary methodologies for, for, for doing uh, GPU sharing, sharing in general, uh, and that's space versus time partitioning, um, where space partitioning uh, has the advantage that if you have two workloads uh, that you're trying to run um, on top of a single GPU, um, both of those workloads will be fully resident at all times because they share access to the GPU in space rather than time. There's no context switching overhead because they're always there, and you get predictable performance from, from these two workloads. Um, where the disadvantages are that you only get a subset of the, GP, uh, the full GPU resources for each of those workloads, and you can have a, a limited number of clients that can make use of the GPU because as you try and pack more and more on, you eventually run out of resources that you can divide amongst the different workloads. Um, this is in contrast to time partitioning, where um, you know you, the advantages of this is that you have the full uh, access to all the full set of resources that are available on the GPU, and you can have an unlimited number of clients. But the disadvantage is that only a resident, each workload is only resident on the GPU for a fraction of the time, and there's some additional context switch overhead as you switch between the different workloads, and this leads to unpredictable uh, unpredictable performance when you don't know exactly how many clients are there, and you're you know you're sharing. Um, um, access to the GPU in time. So, you know, if, for example, I have workload one running here initially. Um, I swap it off a few seconds later. I have workload two running. That then sw switches back to workload one. Uh, and then workload two makes its way back on at some point in the future. Um, what's interesting about this is that the advantages that you get from space partitioning are in direct contrast to the disadvantages that you get for time partitioning and vice versa. So, you know, this really leads to a fundamental inherent trade-off in choosing one strategy over the other. When do I want to use space partitioning and when do I want to use time partitioning? And when Yuan starts talking about some of the benchmarks that we ran at the end, um, he'll highlight when you might want to use one strategy over another depending on the workload type that you have. Um, zooming in on space partitioning in particular, uh, there's two types of space partitioning that we provide for GPUs. One is hardware partitioning. Uh, through a method called multi-instance GPU, or, or MIG for short, where you have physical partitioning of, of a full GPU into a set of uh, sort of mini GPUs where you have full isolation between the different workloads that you're going to run. <clears throat> and in contrast to this, there's um, a software-based uh, space partitioning method that we have called multi-process service, or MPS for short, which allows you to do logical partitioning, but you have limited isolation between the different workloads that you run. If one workload happens to, to, to crash for some reason, it could bring down the other workloads under certain circumstances. And that's not possible with the, hard, uh, the hardware partitioning that we have with MIG. 
Um, so yeah, just highlighting some of the advantages and disadvantages of this. Advantages of this. Uh, Multi-instance GPUs give you full fault isolation. There's some guaranteed memory uh, bandwidth QoS between the different instances that you have running on each MIG device. Uh, and it's suitable for multi-tenant environments. There's no, no one can tamper with, a, with the workload running uh, from one MIG device to, the another, to, to another. Um, where the primary disadvantage of MIG is that you're really limited to a fixed set of partition sizes. Um, MIG as a technology only allows you to divide the, the GPUs in a fixed set of ways um, and you can't um, subdivide it in, in, any, in any way other than that. Um, in contrast, multi-process service, or MPS, uh, has flexible partition sizes across multiple dimensions. So you can decide what lim memory limits you want to set um, independent of what uh, compute limits you want to set for any uh, device that you slice up on the GPU. Um, but the disadvantage is that you have limited fault isolation, there's no memory bandwidth QoS, and it's not really suitable for multi-tenant environments which similar to the uh, space versus time partitioning advantages and disadvantages that I showed before, these are kind of in direct contrast to each other. So when do I choose space partitioning, uh, sorry, when do I choose software-based space partitioning versus hardware-based uh, partitioning is again something that Yuan will highlight uh, when, he works through the, when he walks through the benchmarks that we talked about at the end of the talk. Um, so with, these, with, the, with the different types of sharing strategies that are available on GPUs, you can actually layer them on top of one another. Um, so looking at the example I have here on the left, you can imagine that, you know, in the base case, you have two applications, each with dedicated access to their own, uh, their own GPU. Um, um, and on top of this, you could layer in the methodology of either time slicing or MPS so that you can multiplex multiple applications on top of those GPUs. <clears throat> Similarly, with MIG devices, you can take a GPU, you can subdivide it into multiple MIG devices, you can have one app running on each of those MIG devices, and then you can layer time slicing or MPS on top of that. So you can actually multiplex your application on top of a MIG device with either the space partitioning or the time, part uh, time slicing uh, methodology. Um, there's also a technology that, uh, that NVIDIA provides called vGPUs, which looks like a full GPU um, in terms of how it time slices access to GPUs, but it's wrapping the GPU inside of a hypervisor at the VM layer so that you get that extra level of protection um, that you wouldn't otherwise have if you were just running directly on, a, on what we call a pass-through GPU. Um, and similarly, you can have what's called a MIG-backed MIG vGPU so that you can take a MIG device inside of a full GPU, put a, put it, wrap it in a, in a vGPU inside of a VM, and then layer time slicing uh, on top of that or MPS on top of that with a set of applications that you want to run uh, in that environment. <clears throat> and then the fifth and final uh, GPU sharing strategy that we have is something called CUDA streams, uh, which is something that exists at the application layer. It's not a system level uh, sharing methodology like time slicing MP and MPS are, but it's something that the application developer has to actually take into account to make sure that he's properly sharing the, the individual resources that are available on a GPU so you can run multiple ker kernels in parallel. Um, if you've heard me talk about in the past uh, GPU sharing strategies, these are the five that I always highlight, um, but we're only gonna focus on the top three today, mostly because virtual GPUs, um, vGPUs are something that you kind of decide a priori whether you want to use in your system or not. Likewise, with CUDA streams, it's something that an application developer will decide if their application has or not. If, if they haven't implemented that, it's not available to you. And so these are the three dimensions, at least in the context of Kubernetes, that you can really play around with to decide, you know, I have an application I wanna run, do I want it set up with time slicing, MIG, or MPS? And we're gonna kinda show you how you can make use of these and layer them on top of each other in different ways based on the workload demands that, that you have. Um, so before I go into, you know, the DRA, the dynamic resource allocation aspects of this, I just want to show how, really quickly, how we do GPU sharing in, uh, with these different methods in Kubernetes today. Um, so what you see here on the left is uh, a pod spec that's requesting access to a single GPU using the extended resource type of nvidia.com slash GPU. Um, <clears throat> and when you do that, you know, the, the picture on the right, we've got a couple of components that kick into gear to make sure that the, the, the request for that GPU eventually makes its way into the container that you run with your pod. Um, in addition to that, you can um, use labels that get applied by a component we have called GPU Feature Discovery to allow you to um, <coughs> um, specify a specific type of GPU that you want your pod to land on. And as long as a GPU is available on a specific node, 
that matches those labels, your pod will be directed there rather than to a, uh, a different node. Um, likewise, we have a, the ability to uh, oversubscribe GPUs such that time slicing will um, kick in and allow you to make, you know, to, to share workloads on top of a GPU using, uh, using time slicing. Um, and this is done on a per node basis using the, a config like you see here on the right. So um, you would apply this config on your node saying that all the GPUs on that node that are exposed using the nvidia.com slash GPU resource type um, should be divided into three pieces such that three separate uh, contexts can be oversubscribed, CUDA contexts can be oversubscribed on top of that. And the way that you request access to a resource that's been divided up this way is by um, <clears throat> using kind of the extended, uh, extended, extended resource type of nvidia.com slash GPU, we, we append this dot shared uh, name on top of that to make sure that you land on a node that's been divided up using um, one of the time, time slicing or MPS methods, um, which is what I show here. So, you know, if this is what it looks like to have a config to allow you to create a set of uh, replicas for time slicing, similarly, we do the same thing with, with, with MPS. So if you have nvidia.com slash GPU replicas three, that basically says all the GPUs that I have on the machine, I want to space partition into, um, you know, three, uh, three identically sized um, pieces that are consuming a third of the resources on the GPU. <coughs> um, MIG uh, is, has, a, has a similar um, syntax for you to request access to it. So what I'm showing here on the left is that if you want access to a 1G, 5GB device, uh, you, would, you would put this in your limits rather than nvidia.com slash GPU, and then you get access to this, this exact size of uh, a MIG slice that you want access to. Um, and similarly, if you layer time slicing on top of it, you use the dot shared um, extension to, to get access to a time sliced um, MIG device. Similarly with MPS. Um, there's a couple of limitations that I want to highlight with this. Um, the first is that there's no control over how time sliced GPUs get shared between jobs. This is all kind of behind the scenes, managed by between the device plugin and the kublet. You as the user don't know which GPU you're going to be run on relative to other jobs that are in the system. That's completely up to the kublet to decide. Um, there's also no control over how MPS partition GPUs get shared between jobs, just like with the time sliced ones. Um, and there's no ability to precisely control what fraction of a GPU gets handed out per job. That's done via config file at the node level um, <clears throat> without control from, from the end user. And there's also no ability to dynamically provision MIG devices based on incoming requests. That has to all be kind of set up a priori. Um, now, there have been some systems that try to overcome this, this notion of the ability to precisely control fractions of GPUs handed out per job. And I just want to highlight them uh, very quickly here, Run AI, Volcano, and Hami. Um, the, the disadvantage here, though, is that they're still limited to this um, you know, uh, extended resource model and there has to be a custom scheduler component that allows them to schedule things based on the resource requests that are coming in. It's not something you can use out of the box uh, for any type of pod that gets launched on the system. So what does GP sharing with DRA look like? Um, you know, DRA itself is a new way of requesting resources that have been available since Kubernetes 126, but it's graduating to beta in the upcoming 132 release. We announced this earlier this week at KubeCon. It was public knowledge because uh, anyone could look at the PR to see that it was merged, but it's the first time we kind of spoke publicly about it was just the other day. Um, and some of the key concepts with this is that of a device class and a resource claim, which I'll show in some of the examples coming up here. Um, so if you have an application uh, similar to what I showed before with dedicated GPUs, nvidia.com slash GPU2, what does this look like in the, in the DRA world? Well, the first thing you do is you create something called a resource claim or a resource claim template which is just a way to define what a resource claim could be generated from um, if you have a controller that's capable of doing that. And you associate uh, this resource claim with a specific device class. In this case, the gpu.nvidia.com device class, which, which will be installed by the DRA driver <coughs> that um, you've deployed to govern a set of devices on your cluster. Um, and then in addition to that, you create your pod and you have a new section at the bottom called resource claims, which point to that uh, resource claim template. And it's important that it's a template here because every reference to this template will create a unique resource claim behind the scenes with its own unique uh, GPU mapped to that. And once you have reference to both of those, then you create a local name and you reference that back in your container. And so 
you know, this whole thing looks a bit more complicated and you wouldn't want to necessarily use this if this was the only thing that you wanted to do with it was just get access to two GPUs. But what this allows you to now do is in the, in the case of GPU sharing is that if instead of having nvidia.com slash GPU shared one uh, for two different containers in the same pod, you can now have this one resource claim. Uh, you reference that down in your resource claim section of your pod, give it a local name, and now you control exactly how that GPU gets shared between two different containers. And this can be extended to multiple pods. You create a resource claim, you reference that in two different pods, and the container that's within that pod has access to that same underlying GPU and it's controlled by you as the user rather than being left up to the system um, to decide how it wanted to do the GPU sharing uh, across different G GPUs that it had access to. Um, in terms of time slicing versus MPS, you know, in, 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 in the existing device plugin model, you have a per node config that needs to be set up. In the DRA world, you can have uh, a per resource claim config that gets set up such that when you have a GPU that gets bound to this claim that you've requested, you can say whether you want time slicing set up for that or MPS set up for that with the limits that you want. Um, so it's not left up to the system anymore. You can precisely control how you want these things to be shared. Um, and this layers on top of MIG. So, you know, in the, in the previous examples, I was talking about full GPUs, but if you want to instead request access to a MIG device, you can have this config that sets up time slicing on top of that uh, or MPS on top of that MIG device. Uh, and with that introduction, I'll hand things over to Yuan, who will talk about the benchmark study that we did based on all of this. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, thanks for Kevin to Kevin for the excellent overview and the introduction of DIA and the GPU strategy. Next, I will share some key results and observations from a benchmark study on different uh, the GPU sharing strategy using DIA. So we look at a different type of workload from the inference workload to smaller GPU batch job to GPU intensive batch job using time slicing, MPS without limits and with limits and also meet. So firstly, let's look at the inference <coughs> workload. Here is our setup. We use the NVIDIA the Triton and the inference server and create two instance. Uh, the client, we use a tool called a performance analyzer can generate the different request at a different rate. We control like the request rate to simulate the, the, the uh, demand on the inference server. So like Kevin showed earlier, so this examples, the resource claim, as you can see, we define resource claim, then you can specify the sharing and the strategy. In your port spec, you reference this resource claim. So we look at the time slicing, we look at the MPS, and uh, this is MPS with the resource and the limits. Uh, so this here and use the application and uh, environment variable to limit the compute and the memory resources. So okay, this is first set of the results, and it's lower request rate and uh, like a knighted and noded and inference server. So we look at this and the latency throughput performance and also GPU utilization. The yellow bar is the dedicated use the uh, single GPU without sharing and uh, the orange bar is two instance and the inference server sharing the GPU. As you can see, for the 19 node inference server, definitely by sharing the GPU improve the utilization without hurting the performance. And one thing and uh, beware and please note that is by running and uh, two and instance Actually, the GPU and uh, usage are not and, uh, doubled, it's tripled, right? And uh, on the paper, the optimal should be just 20%. So that is from the context overhead, uh, the time slicing. So that's something and, uh, we have to be aware. Uh, so if we look at that, use the MPS, so we got a similar results, right? Without hurting the performance and uh, improve the utilization. Also, almost uh, and uh, just uh, double the CP, uh, GPU usage. So the MPS have much lower and, uh, resource and uh, overhead. Uh, but because it's software partition memory, it can only offer a limited and uh, fault and uh, isolation. Also, we noticed that the stop time of this and the try to inference server and took longer time than the time slicing. Also, you probably noticed that for MPS, there are additional and uh, 
demo set running, but the footprint and, uh, is very low, uh, just uh, 20 megabytes memory. And, uh, so next, we look at a uh, heavily load inference server. So for this one, the, the client send uh, and, uh, quite high request and the uh, read to the server. As you can see, the time slicing, definitely this and the uh, resource contention there, the performance degradation, we got the higher latency and a lower throughput. The GPU is 100% usage. If we look at the MPS without resource limits, yeah, the performance also and the, yeah, got worse, but uh, the performance degradation and uh, yeah is much less than the uh, time slicing again okay, because without the context switch overhead. Next, if we limited one of the applications and the resource and the usage, so the scenario could be it's a no priority or some development job. We look at this and the. Uh, uh, better perform applications or inference service performance, yeah, it's much better, almost uh, yeah, the same as the single case, uh, the dedicated use case. So, so this means the MPS and with resource limits to summarize, right, for the 90 loaded inference server, both the time slicing and the MPS probably are okay, and uh, time slicing have a higher and, uh, overhead and uh, from the contact switch. For heavily loaded, uh, uh, inference server probably will only use the time slicing for the not latency intense, uh, sensitive and workloads and uh, for example maybe some batch and uh, offline and the inference and more care about the throughput <coughs> and uh, MPS plus the resource limits and uh, could be a better solution uh, but beware yeah the context switch overhead for time slicing and the MPS cannot provide this hard guarantee in terms of the memory and fault isolation Okay, so next we look at some of the batch job, and we start to look at some small batch job to simulate this and this micro benchmark. We just run some CUDA and uh, matrix and uh, multiplication. Uh, we compare the scenarios that, okay, run a single job on a dedicated GPU, then on four parallel the matrix and the multiplication jobs and sharing the GPU, use time slicing, MPS, yeah, again, that's the, just the, the, using the DRE, define the resource claim, specify the strategy, time slicing, MPS. Okay, that's the first results and use the time slicing. As you can see, if you only run a single job, it cannot fully use this GPU. The GPU is 35%, that means a waste a lot of the expensive and the GPU resources. Now we run four parallel jobs, we can use, fully utilize the GPU. And uh, of course, the completion time and the increase, probably it's okay for batch job. This is the results from APS and the sharing, as you can see, and uh, yeah, much better. And uh, the performance almost stay the same. We, we even still have some headroom, probably can run one more job. So let's definitely de demonstrate the benefit by sharing the small and the GPU and the batch job and uh, using the MPS. Uh, so the key takeaway for this is, yeah, for this small batch job, definitely should take advantage and uh, by sharing the GPU and use time slicing, and the time slicing probably cannot provide the, the, the optimal performance, MPS, and uh, because the flexible partitioning and the lower overhead and uh, uh, is a bad solution. Uh, next is, let's look at the very GPU intensive and workload. We use the, as much as possible, right, resources. So for this benchmark, that's the setup, right? We, we use a micro benchmark called GPU burn. It's basically like a stress testing and run a single one on a dedicated GPU, then run two GPU burn jobs using different sharing strategy, time slicing, MPS without a limit and the MPS plus limits. So again, yeah, here is the example of the YAML file. So for the time slicing, as you can see here, and uh, the single job use like the 23, 24 gigabytes memory. We run two parallel one. There are no resource guarantee or fair sharing here. The job one use and almost 10 times of the GPU memory than the second one because there are no guarantee there. If you run, uh, we use the MPS without resource limits, got the similar results. But what about like the, I should probably mention and uh, Early, yeah, let me go back to this one. Yeah, for this and we limited resources, use the MPS uh, configurations. This specify the 
default limits, and it's 50%, basically means half-half resources can be used by these two. So now, if we look at us with resource limits, right, each of them got like a five gigabytes memory specified by the resource claim. So this two and uh, the GPU for the very GPU intensive jobs and time slicing definitely not a good choice. Instead, and we should consider to use this MPS with the proper resource limits and can provide much better resource isolation. Let's see, um, okay. So last, we demonstrated also evaluated the MIG configuration. And this is uh, A100. We partition four of the eight GPU devices into four MIG devices, two small, one GPU, five gig memory, and one medium one, and one three GPU, 20 gig uh, bytes memory. And uh, so for the inference workload, that's all set up. And we just uh, use a small instance to run, we call it a small instance server, and then use this and the three GPU and the 20 gig bytes to run a large inference server. And then we evaluate, look at the performance on the different and uh, resource and uh, request rate, some no resource request rate, heavy request rate. And uh, again, yeah, that's the, as you can see, yeah, for MIG, then you have a different uh, GPU uh, device class name, also, yeah, other individual and uh, the uh, fields. Then that's the large and the instance, there's the small instance. Okay, uh, that, that's our results. As you can see, <laughs> under the knighted and the loaded and uh, the, the server cases, Scenario, yeah, both almost the same performance, right? When you, the, your request and uh, increase a lot, and the large instance still can handle that and achieve similar performance, but uh, the small one uh, got much worse. So the key point here is just said, uh, yeah, if you write a size of the workload depending on the request uh, or workload demand, uh, you can definitely make, can provide this and uh, strong and, uh, performance and uh, isolation. So what about the GPU intensive and uh, workload used the MIG? So now we run and uh, yeah, one of the GPU burn job, this is the uh, uh, GPU intensive job, use the small instance, and a second job and use large instance. And we look at two scenarios, normal scenario, just let them run, another scenario, and we purposely and inject an error, let the first job out of memory error crash. Let's see what happened, okay? Again, that's the sum. Okay, the first scenario, as you can see, because the first, uh, Job used the small instance and it just used up to like the five gig uh, bytes memory. That's what we expected, right? It's one five gig bytes. The second one can use up to like the 20 gig bytes memory. So they are perfect uh, in the isolation. So then we crash the first one because it's try to allocate more memory. As you can see, yeah, the first job crashed, but uh, the second job, there are no impact inference on the second job. So to recap this, yeah, MIG definitely can provide the strong and the enhanced QS and, the photo and the isolation. It's very good, and if you have multi-tenants, you won't have the strong isolation. Uh, on the downside and uh, the current implementation, of course, the MIG is more static configuration. You can only and uh, partition and uh, create and uh, seven instance. There are some interesting work from IBM and uh, talk about this uh, more dynamically and uh, partitioning and the size of the MIG, then, yeah, uh, develop some optimizing the scheduling. I think that is a very interesting work. Okay, so summarize the benchmark and the results. So what kind of the strategy is good for different of the workloads, right, as we mentioned. So for inference workload, if it's 19 noted, probably it's okay, just be aware the time slicing share strategy have some overhead for heavy and loaded one. So be careful and it definitely can hurt your latency and so it's depending on it's the online, offline or your QS or SLA. And for small batch job, it's fine. Definitely should take advantage of it. GPU intensive one, use MPS with the limits and can provide better isolation. But if you want strong and isolation, the QS guarantee definitely big is the best one. So if we look at it from different category, right? Performance isolation, for tolerance, and uh, yeah, we will see, and as we show the results, different kind of trade-off here, and uh, that's something that, uh, yeah, probably uh, when you configure the policy, you should uh, keep in mind. So uh, the key takeaway and the GPU sharing is a very and uh, useful strategy and can help improve the utilization, reduce the cost, 
but there are trade-offs there, and we should definitely take into account and uh, all different aspects. Then DRA is very, very important feature, and uh, support all this flexible and configuration should be take, taken advantage, and as Kevin mentioned, yeah, it's going to be better, and in next release 132, and for time slicing, it's easy config, but their context and the switch was kind of provided a uh, resource and a guarantee. MPS, software-based, very flexible, but cannot provide the, the strong and the memory-related force, force and the isolation. Leak is a hardware-based approach, can provide the strongest and the isolation, and it has some fix and the partition size, also how to right size it is very critical. There's some reference, and uh, please check out, and uh, yeah, scan the barcode, provide your feedback, would it be appreciated, and uh, I don't know if we have time right, for some questions, and uh, yeah, so yeah, we probably can take and, uh, a couple of questions, and then come to talk to us after the session, and uh, also you can find us at NVIDIA booth if you want to. Uh, have additional discussions or learn more about NVIDIA technology. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I have a question. So, um, you know, what what y'all are doing is great, and I, you know, started thinking about how we would enable it in our you know self service developer portal where we don't necessarily know what kind of workload they're gonna onboard, what they're gonna do. And so that, that sort of kind of makes, you know, creating device classes ahead of time like really challenging, right? So, you know, when I think about it like from a, a generic Kubernetes resource request perspective, I mean, it's really easy to request like fractions or, you know, multiples of CPU uh, and memory. And then, you know, between Kubernetes placement and the kernel scheduler, you know, that all just sort of kind of happens. So is there is there any time or are you all thinking about, you know, even further simplifying your model such that, you know, a workload could come in and just as it, without creating device classes and slicing and, and all that stuff where I can just say, I want half, you know, request a 0.2 of a GPU and limit to 0.5 of a GPU and, you know, I need, you know, a limit of, 10 gigs of VRAM. Is that something you're looking at? It is, yeah. Um, uh, so we gave a talk yesterday on uh, an update from the device management working group, which is the working group within Kubernetes that kind of governs all the DRA work that we're doing. Uh, and one of the things we highlighted in there is that there's lots of usability improvements that we could still make to all of this. You know, we've built this base functionality, but exactly what end user, uh, end user facing API we want to provide at, at, at the end of this is still in flux. So the, one, of the, one of the kind of first level ideas that we have is to basically bring back the extended resource type that we have today, nvidia.com slash GPU, but have a way for the scheduler and other components in the system to actually leverage DRA to do those allocations so that you don't have to have the device plugin running behind the scenes so that if someone wants to use the more sophisticated interface to do selection and configuration of the devices that they want access to, they can, but if they want to use the simpler API, they can do that as well. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> I had a question. Could we go back to the rest, uh, performance uh, bar graphs that you had, like the improvements? You mean the inference? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Which one? Okay. One question was the MPS with resource. So this is a quick question, but uh, it performed better when you did MPS with resource limits as opposed to without. Could you just clarify, yeah, why that is? Yeah, so so like we mentioned, uh, yeah, Kevin said, the time slicing, you have the swapping out in memory. M MPS with and without limits, you said. Oh, without limits, with limits, okay. So the without limits and uh, because there are no guarantee how these two and the inference server share the resources, right? Like we should there, and they could some randomly or whatever we the shared resources. So okay. the performance, yeah, you don't know. So it's know more beneficial to use it. With limits, basically we limit one of the application, as I said. You can use only up to, in this case, is 10% of the 
usage make a low priority okay. job. So then you can provide a better performance. And, yeah. uh, Otherwise, you run one. the risk of the first application yeah. consuming all the resources, so the second one doesn't have any available for it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so it's better Doesn't to know up sense. front. The, and then the other, the last thing was between time slicing and MPS. I think you mentioned this, sorry, but can mm -hmm. you just uh, clarify that again? Why there's a performance difference there? I guess time slicing is at a lower level than MPS is, right? So that yeah. causes a performance difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. I was wondering how exactly uh, one should go about setting the limits for MPS, uh, for the resource limits. Is there an objective way to find those uh, values? You mean, you mean how to decide what limits you should set? Yeah. Um, this actually relates back to the talk I just came from before this. Um, there's no, I think, uh, standard methodology for that. Um, but you can empirically kind of figure out by either benchmarking an application a priori and knowing what type of workloads it, or what type of um, uh, input it might have to it that, that would cause it to run with a certain amount of memory that it consumes and a certain amount of compute that it does. But there's no uh, yeah, standard methodology for it as, as far as I know. Got it. Yeah. And yeah, I just make a comment yeah, to, to this one. I think this and the study just the right and uh, give probably should uh, capability of the DRA and the sharing strategy and the mechanism here, right? Or some methodology knowledge we issue and, but how you set this value, right? And uh, mm. I think the previous talk there, some apply even some reinforcement and learning other thing. Do benchmark, mm. under the create more realistic uh, and uh, benchmark and uh, set up, right? And they are not for technology and how to sizing it. That's a separate topic, definitely very interesting yeah, moving forward, but uh, <coughs> it's probably a little bit out of the scope of this, right?